thanks for inviting me here, everybody. Uh, I guess e evictions and renovations aren't anything new, and uh, I guess they go back to 1792, really, around here. Uh, so the way we started was probably makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, last time I was here in this room, I think, um, been here for a few meetings, but not for several years. And the last time I was here, I remember eating a, a rather burnt spaghetti dinner um, with a lot of the other people who, like me, were, you know, in need of a, in need of a meal and, um, you know, marginally housed. And I've, I've been in all states of housing in this neighborhood. I've been in, uh, you know, rental, crappy rental, okay rental, shared houses with too many people with the wrong last names all in the same place, uh, everyone putting their welfare check together and getting a place. Uh, I've been totally homeless, landed gentry, like everything, spans the whole classes. And so the neighborhood to me always felt like that was okay, you know, and there's a lot of places where it's, it's not okay. Um, and this is the one place that I've always felt, or, or at least you know, been a lot of places in the world that I haven't felt at home like any place like I have here. And that's, that's why I live here and I want to keep living here. And I think Lots of us are experiencing the fear of the divide between the east and the west of the city starting to drift east. And I don't want to see that overtake uh, our part of the city, too. Um, you know, so last summer, I was one of the people who was just minding my own and suddenly heard they wanted to build a 37-story monolith <laughs> condo tower extraordinaire right over top of where Safeway was and then put a whole bunch of satellite towers into different parts of the neighborhood. And, and you know the way people talk to each other on the left, it's there's a little bit of hyperbole. Okay, I won't bullshit you. Like sometimes there's a bit of exaggeration. Like read the pamphlets. You know the grammar can. You know it's. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So there's going to be buildings everywhere, and then they're gonna, we're going to be surrounded. And then I looked at the plan, and it's true. <laughs> we were actually underselling it. It was quite amazing what the city had planned, and you know the city said that they had consulted and had workshops, and of course. Consultation is a tricky used car sales kind of a business, you know, when it comes down to it. And so, yes, they maybe consulted about the, the color of the car, but not the fact that there was no engine or something like that, right? So people thought they had had a discussion, which they actually hadn't had. And so people were starting to react over last summer as neighbors talking to neighbors, people starting together in meetings. And the city was starting to feel this. The city was starting to say, oh, shit, maybe we you know, slipped in a little too much there and we should have soft sold it a little bit. And that's the planning process that Teresa was talking about and saying, I don't know if you have time for it. And, and fair comment, you know, like it's a, it's a dubious, dubious thing. And, and the kind of sweats I think that Maureen was talking about, about getting involved in any kind of super bureaucratic process would apply, you know, tenfold to this one. And I know Jack King is here, uh, was here somewhere and, and he can, I mean, he's the expert in that. He can read you inside and out. But the, so the city right now is, is still considering what to do on top of us here. And um, Bruce McDonald, a historian of this part of the city, told me, uh, told a bunch of us, he said, this, this neighborhood developed its character and the way it was before there was planning. So the city, the, the neighborhood emerged organically by itself from below. And that's what's great about it. You know, we, we spend our time in this community because we love to live here, not because it's you know, some statistically, algorithmically proper place for us to live. People come together as a community, and you meet on, on Commercial Drive in the back of a coffee shop, or you used to be able to meet in the back of a coffee shop as a little a socialist community, or across the street you can meet in La Cana as a uh, Latin American solidarity group or an anarchist group, and, and now that's a yoga studio and a waves. And you, you can't meet there unless you have your right amount of frappuccino and downward dog respectively. And, you know, so, so this is the type of changes that is happening. And I think it's, it's making the neighborhood into a place where it's it is kind of a more cool or hip experience. I, I'm worried about that, too. But the city is seeing that. And then, then they're saying, oh, not without us. You know, we're going to we're going to own this. And um, they have this logic, which is if you want any kind of services, like if you want any kind of community center or daycare or anything like that, well, they're not in the business of doing that anymore. The people who do that for us now are developers. And the city is in the business of allowing developers to build something and maybe build it a little extra tall and then in return for the city backing off, really being like keeping it low or whatever, the developer will be required to put in a little daycare center, or put in a little park or, or whatever amenities or services or, or a pocket park or whatever you want to call them now. And so this is the, this is the quid pro quo. And I learned about this because I went to one of these planning sessions last summer after I 
heard what I thought was um, you know, our classic lefty hyperbole, which was actually the true city plan. So they held a meeting, they, the city did. They said they called us, everyone together, concerned residents, and it was at the uh, community center, the Croatian Cultural Center down there. And it was a Saturday, and the, everybody was crammed in, and there was a waiting list and a lineup, and you know, there was maybe 120 people in the room and still a, a few hundred more that couldn't get in. People really wanted to talk about this. And, and so the city was like, okay, okay, we got it wrong, we got it wrong, let's start again. And their idea of starting again was we were all divided up into groups of 10, put at different tables. The table had a big map of Grandview Woodlands, and each, each table got a box of basically Lego. And the Lego represented various denominations of buildings from 2 to 6 to 18 to 25 to suborbital or whatever, right? Story buildings. And you had to take your Lego and you had to cram it and figure out and put it in the Grandview Woodlands somehow. As if that we had to go and take the logic of the city and, and put it, and go, don't get me wrong, I, I agree, Grandview Woodlands has always been a welcoming place for people from anywhere in the world. I think it should still be. There's still room for more. But the way, the way we want to, and room for more, not to displace people who already live here. And this is the fundamental thing the city keeps failing to understand. And this is why um, working uh, in the city's planning process can be kind of like hitting your head against that box of Lego again and again, because that, that fundamental truth is, is evasive or else they know it and disagree. Because the plan to put in uh, lots of large towers, and I, I'm not against even large towers, but the, the glass and chrome monoliths that contain only top-end, high-end condos will change not just the footprint of where they sit, but everywhere around. Because the economic and social footprint of one of those buildings is very large. And the plan to have these buildings sprinkled all over Grandview Woodlands means that these pools will intersect and you will just get an entirely changed neighborhood by virtue of the economic power that comes out of those buildings. And that means that all the other places, um, those places that are demolished to make way for such buildings or those places that manage to exist in their shadows will no longer have rental housing that's available um, to people who are, well, non rich or non middle to, to higher income. You know, so it, it will it will not just it's not just about increasing the density, which is the buzzwords for the city. They say to us, you guys are environmentalists, you don't want to see sprawl all the way out to the suburbs. Come on, be green, have a happy planet juice and get on your bike because it's environmental, right? And so we're supposed to buy uh, no, I mean this is uh, uh, okay, I'm making a sketch here, right? But it's this is the logic of it is that is that since you don't want sprawl, you've got to accept density. And I think you can do density without doing gentri gentrification in condos, right? This, it's not rocket science. There is room within the existing zoning. You, people have put these neat little, uh, I mean, just you could change that law that says only two people with the last name can live in the same house. You know, that probably would be a good start. But, but the city right now is, is tied into the logic of get a developer to build something very big and then uh, allow services to be given out by the developer. And I think that we have to break from that. The city actually has to be responsible for the services that people pay taxes to provide. But I don't want to put this all the doorstep of Vision Vancouver because the goalposts in our society have moved so far to the right that Vision Vancouver appears to be a, you know, a relative pro progressive party. P people don't see it as a, as a party of developers out, out in the rest of the world. Um, they see it as a, as a relatively progressive thing. I think that, um, you know, in the upcoming campaign, that should be unmasked. In the upcoming election campaign, that should be unmasked for sure. But also the history of this city is to have developers sit in that place on 12th and Canby and run the place. That's been the history for almost all of it, but for, for a small few years. And so we should also have plan B in case, my God, that happens again in November which is build a strong social movement so that the voices that are the naysayers that we were talking about before, so that the, the voices that are the few for the developers of the 1% are massively outgunned and we can create a, a pole of attraction, a gravity that can actually start to pull those goalposts back in line, at least in our neighborhood. And if we can't start the fight here, this is the beachhead, this is the traditional home of the left in Vancouver. This is where we have to make the fight in this neighborhood, right? And so we need an electoral strategy. We need to take the levers of city government into our own hands to make it better for renters, but we also need to build a social movement on the ground with our community and with all the other communities in Vancouver that are facing the same bullshit. So yeah, thanks very much for having me.